The Chargers had a major letdown on Sunday against the Texans. No excuses for this one. The Chargers' playoff chances took a huge hit by losing to a team they never should have lost to. And there's a lot of blame to go around for a performance like that against a 3-11 and team. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Locked On Chargers Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade. Joined as always, my co-host, David Drogemeyer, and we've been covering this team for the last five seasons, we started with our own Facebook Live show, Chargers Domination Live. And now this is our fourth season as the host of the Locked On Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. And the thing about being a host for as long as we have, David, and covering this team as long as we have, David, is we've seen some things. But Sunday, I mean, really even challenged some of the worst Chargers losses just because of the opponent. But if you haven't already, make sure to go and subscribe to the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel and follow the show for free on all platforms, wherever you get your podcast from. Thank you guys for coming in for this one because I know I've had people, you know, tweet me and stuff and say, like, I don't know if I can listen tomorrow. I get it. But I do have the ultimate respect for the people who can come in and listen on a day like this because the Chargers' chances aren't over. The season isn't over as much as it feels like it right now. Do they have a hell of a lot more work to do now? Absolutely, they do. But the Chargers getting dismantled by the Houston Texans in a game that felt more like a blowout than the final score would even indicate just because of how thoroughly the handling was of the Chargers. And there was a lot that went into this, David. But either way, I mean, this is a disappointment. You lose 41-29 to to the Houston Texans. You fall to 8-7 and and right in the middle of the pack in the AFC, a very crowded AFC. And now you don't control your own destiny. I think that's the part that hurts the most. It's just you had the path and you had to win out, and you ended up losing the easiest game left on your schedule. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, that's the first thing that comes to my mind is, yeah, I understand both teams had a lot of issues, a lot of injuries, a lot of COVID issues. Uh, I mean, and all of that could have been a distraction. And and maybe it was for, for one team. Maybe it was for the Chargers because they didn't show up like they were prepared to play. Chris, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Chris Harris Jr. said in the press conference, we didn't show up to play as a team today. And to me, that seemed pretty clear. I was at that game. I had field level tickets with my dad. I was excited to have a great, great experience, watch a, a Chargers team that was thoroughly more talented and should have beat the brakes off of this team. No, yeah. there, there's really no questions, but that didn't happen. The Chargers did not show up. They played uninspired football on both sides of the ball, especially on the defense. But this was a backbreaker. The three games that were left on the schedule, this is the one you felt the most comfortable that the Chargers were going to be able to show up, get the dub and keep it moving on their way towards finishing up with the playoff spot. That didn't happen. The Chargers were really, really bad yesterday. They were. I mean, it's just hard to even, you know, quantify everything in such a short show. I mean, and I also don't want to kind of, you know, linger on it and just Neither do I. think about it throughout the rest of the week. And we're going to do the show a little bit differently today. We're not going to do a full blown recap of the game and go, you know, half by half. But I do think we have to get into a certain sequence of plays. There was three sequences for me where the Chargers really let this game get away. And I do want to talk about those. And I also want to kind of talk about what the blame or who the blame should be most on. And we'll get into that in the next segment. Just how much does Brandon Staley deserve, you know, to take the criticism after a defensive performance like that as a defensive minded coach? Or is it the personnel? And that's something I'm excited to get into as well, because the depth of the charge was absolutely exposed on Sunday because there was a big gap between who the Chargers, you know, had out there before and the guys they had to replace them. And, you know, there's some development, things like that. But I'm glad you brought up the defense, though, because I think that was the worst part of the day. I mean, the worst unit for the Chargers was absolutely the defense. And it started with, you know, third downs and, the you know, continuing to not be able to get off the field on third downs. The run defense had a huge, you know, regression in this one. They didn't have Justin Jones or Joe Gaziano. Justin Jones specifically obviously really hurt them, but super soft against the run in this one. That was hard to watch. Kenneth Murray was hard to watch on the edge. And also just 9 out of 13 third downs, you let them convert for a team that averaged 38% third down conversions this season, one of the worst teams in the NFL. You allow the worst rushing team 
in the NFL. They were averaging 77 rushing yards per game. They had only eclipsed 100 rushing yards once or twice in this season, right? And you let them go for almost 200 yards at five and a half yards per carry. And I think that's what I'm upset with myself about. David is just like, I knew the Chargers defense wasn't good, right? They're not a complete defense. I think I underestimated how much, you know, not having Joey Bosa and Derwin James and Michael Davis and Justin Jones was going to change things because the Chargers looked like straight up the worst defense in the NFL on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, they couldn't do anything. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of players on, on the field who normally play a lot of snaps, but that's the nature of the business. Everyone's dealing with that right now. So you got to go out there and perform. I mean, that's, that's really the bottom line, and they did do that at all in this game. According to Daniel Popper, the Houston Texans accrued 16% of their explosive plays in this game. I just want I just want you to take a second to think about that. That is how bad, how historically bad this Chargers defense. You let a 31-year-old running back named Rex Burkett, who is averaging a little over three yards rush for nearly 200 yards on the game, on the day. And he was running through massive holes with an offensive line that was a fourth, maybe fifth string offensive line. Guys, they signed off to strip that showed up to play and they were more of a, more motivated than a Chargers team that had a lot more of their players out there. They couldn't do anything. And then I guess the, the pass, you you give up massive passing plays uh, and and that's complete that when you're you're not stopping the run, you're not stopping the pass, you're not doing anything. The the Texans went up and down the field at will. Yeah, and I mean, the, you know, safeties didn't have a good game. The edge rushers had an awful game. There was no pressure from the what Chargers edge rushers? to the front. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for sure. And that's the, why I kicked myself a little bit, just because it's like, I guess I should have known. I thought it would be mostly Jerry Tillery, and they would just go big, you know, at least have a bigger guy on the edge. They went mostly. They should have, obviously. Yeah, and I mean, to let Rex Burkhead, you know, average, I think it was like 6.8 yards per carry and get two touchdowns is gross. Davis Mills, you let go 21 of 27 with a passer rating of over 130 in this one, a QBR of 77.3. You know, it's because he was comfortable for a long. Chargers got no pass rush. No one got, besides the Jerry Tillery sack, no one got anywhere close to him. And he was able to sit back there all day long and pick apart, you know, throw these dink and dunk passes and lull them to sleep with the running game and then hit him, hit him over the top with the big plays. Hey, you got to give credit for Davis to Davis mills. He played a good game in, in this one. He was efficient. He was effective. And when you get no pressure on the quarterback, it's a lot easier to play that position. Yeah. He had some really good deep throws. I mean, 41 yard touchdown, the charge is allowed a 36 yard gain over Asante Samuel jr. You have other, you know, giant gains in this game from them. 36 yard rush by Rex Burkhead. It was just too, way too easy for the Houston Texans offense. And I think that's why we'll have to talk about how much, you know, blame Brandon Staley has to shoulder really after something like this. But I'm glad you brought that up about Davis Mills, David, because the one thing he didn't do was make the disaster play. And that's what the Chargers offense did. That's Three right. turnovers on the day. Justin Herbert, two bad picks. Justin Jackson, a terrible fumble, which sucks because he had a really good game. I mean, another good game. Yeah, he had a, what, yards. 170? All yeah, per, something all like that. Yards. And two yeah, touchdowns. I mean... Average more than five yards per carry. It sucks that that happened, but we knew what the Chargers offense couldn't do, David, and they do not escape blame in a game like this. Hell no, they don't. I mean, first of all, how does an all-world wide receiver, and I mean all-world, Keenan Allen, have four catches in this game? I don't care if he's getting doubled or not. I really don't. That guy gets open every single play, practically. He is always open. It's like open season. Like, he... There's no excuse when you already know that you're going to be down Mike uh, Mike Williams, your other big big play receiver. You got other receivers like Josh Palmer getting more catches than Keenan Allen, and it's just completely unacceptable. You have to feed that guy. You got to get him involved early in the game. He needs to be a playmaker for you, and I, it just didn't happen. You didn't. I don't feel like the Chargers' offense utilized their weapons to the best of their ability, and Justin did not have his best game in this one. He overthrew some receivers. He made some bad reads. He threw some bad interceptions. When we give credit to Justin when he plays extremely well, we also have to be fair and talk about when he does not play well. And he had a QBR under 50 in this game. Justin Herbert had a bad game. He did not help the Chargers win the football game. 
Yeah, and I think the thing with Herbert is a lot of his yards came late. You know, a lot of dumb downs to Justin Jackson, who was the leading receiver by far in this game against a secondary that wasn't good coming into it, which is a little weird, right? The tight ends never got super involved. It was basically a one-dimensional offense, even though, you know, they ran the ball pretty well. But it, they, Texans definitely made it a focal point to stop Keenan Allen, especially on those third downs and things like that. It doesn't matter. I mean, you have to have a better game plan, and you just have to – execute better i mean you settle for three field goals you had a chance to kind of bury them early on and you didn't take it and that'll be part of the sequences that we talk about later but the chargers defense and offense i mean neither one really did anything for me on sunday it was just a overall flat performance and i think you know like i said brandon staley has to take some of the blame tom telesco definitely has to share some of the blame but so is justin herbert too because those two interceptions were bad so we'll talk about who needs to shoulder the blame for this one the most after this but first i need to tell you guys about something that doesn't make me feel like this game did. And I'm talking about Bilt Bars. I mean, I basically gorged myself with Bilt Bars after that one. I got all my favorite flavors. And it made me feel a little bit better. I'm not going to lie. I had to, you know, get it out of my system by shoving something into my face. And it was Bilt Bars. And it's great because it didn't totally ruin my day because Bilt Bars are one of the only things you're going to find protein bar-wise that's good for you and also tastes good as well. I mean, you're getting a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. And they have a ton of great flavors to choose from. I mean, you can go cookies and cream. You can go peanut butter brownie, Jerry, Barcia, coconut. There's so many flavors to choose from. You can even go with the Built Go Puffs, which are really good as well if you're looking for something a little bit lighter. But Built Bars are great. I mean, they'll get you through the end of the day when you need to push through that wall. I always want to take naps. So that always helps me get through that because I'm getting something that's going to, you know, fuel me for the rest of the day. That also has a ton of protein while being low on sugars and low on total carbs. So make sure you guys check out Built Bar because you're going to find a bar that you like. And right now, you can even save some money because if you go to Built.com, you can use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That's Built.com, promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, David. So one of the things that was obviously going around Chargers Twitter, which was not a fun place to be after that game. I mean... People want the entire coaching staff fired, right? People want Tom Telesco fired. You can basically find whatever you want on there and find a million people to blame for this game. But one thing is that was like, you can be upset without being toxic, right? Yeah. And I, and I think that's one of the things that is hard with Chargers social media, <clears throat> just because it can be a pretty toxic place after some of these games. But people have the right to be very upset about this game. So, One of the people I think was taking the most heat was Brandon Staley. And the people you're missing aren't excuses. The Texans were missing a lot of guys, too. But like I said, I think I underestimated how much the Chargers would miss those specific defensive players like Joey Bosa and Derwin James and Michael Davis and Justin Jones. Because when we recorded our last show last week, Justin Jones and Michael Davis were still in the equation. And that's two big pieces, right? Your best or second best corner, your best run defender, those guys are not going to be in the game. You have to be able to adjust, so I understand why Brandon Staley was taking some heat. There was also a lot of points in this game where, like the 36-yard Rex Burke had run, you have a guy defensively that's in a position to make a great play, get a tackle for loss, bad tackles, bad angles. The guy gets a 36-yard gain. So it is a lot about execution as well. But I think it's this is kind of the question, David, is like how much is it Brandon Staley not you know adapting to the players he had? And he was losing guys consistently all week, right? I mean, it is hard to have a game plan for both sides, right? To not know who you're having and having a different guy taking first reps one day, first team reps the next day, guys going out late in the week where you don't have a chance to get their backups reps. And that, I think, obviously has to affect it a certain amount, right? But at the same time, when you're the defensive genius, when you did it with an imperfect Rams defense in 2020, it comes with a certain level of expectation and the Chargers defense has just been so bad that it's like, are we really just seeing how bad these other defenders are when they're not getting covered up by guys like Derwin James and Joey Bosa? Or is it Brandon Staley just didn't do a good enough job adapting with the players he had to put together a solid performance? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's obviously a great question, but I think when you think about it, like I said before, every single team is dealing with these COVID issues and not knowing who's going out there, who's going to play, who's going to be available. So what that means is you got to put together a plan and and be able to be malleable with that plan, meaning you got to be able to make those adjustments in game. And I don't feel like we saw very much adjustments from Brandon Staley in this game. Uh, and you know, that's one of the major reasons why they, they didn't really you know win the football game. And 
you know, does Tom Telesco deserve some blame? Absolutely he does because that lack of depth, it, that falls squarely on his shoulders. Brandon Staley has been here one one year. Like this is his first year as a head coach, first year with the organization. He was able to sign some guys to make some impact on the offensive line. He was able to you know, add some good pieces in the draft, but Rome was not built in a day. You know, he he's only been Julius Caesar for 14 games, 15 games. So he needs more time. The guy who's been here for a decade, I think it is the one who needs to be looked at a little bit more microscopically. Yeah, I think the other thing that you can definitely give some of the blame to is the way they've used Kenneth Murray, right? Because at this point, it's hard to say what Kenneth Murray is good at because he's failed at least, you know, through two seasons at this point, almost two seasons at being an inside linebacker. And they tried to, you know, transition him to an edge defender in one season, in the middle of the season, I should say, which obviously worked out like it did. I mean, obviously not great not well. from Kenneth Murray. It's hard to pick out a good moment from Kenneth Murray on Sunday. And I think that you can be more creative to get pressure and things like that. And I think it's just hard to say at this point, like I was saying before, just like how good are the guys that are out there? Like how much is he doing? How much more is he getting out of the guys they have? than the other people would get out of them. And that's the hard thing. That's obviously. Yeah. How can quantify. you quantify that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless you see, you know, an extended track record with another team or with another coach, which a lot of these guys don't have. So that's just something. Cause I mean, the stars for the Chargers have still played well. Guys like Kazir White have played much better than we've seen. Derwin James has been great. Joey Bose has been great. Sante Samuel Jr. has been great. Right. So it is working for some players, but I think it, the thing that you can pinpoint for him one thing that was very frustrating was just the decision on fourth down, right? Not to go for it yeah. more than they did. I mean, they had three real opportunities to do it. The first one was a fourth and like nine, I get, you know, something like that, which that's a tough one. It's not a super probable conversion for you. But right. there, the second one where they ended up the second Dustin Hopkins field goal, you had a fourth and five. So you can't come in to the press conference last week and then just exclaim, I'm here for the smoke. I'm ready to take all the blame when things don't go well, right? And then the next week, you're kind of faltering on that because you're not being that aggressive guy that you said that you're just going to continue to be and it was part of your team and all that stuff last week. And, I mean, the fourth and 13 later and, you know, in the third quarter, didn't have that much of a problem the fourth and nine. But the fourth and five against that Texans team, when you have a chance early on to really kind of take control of the game against the team that's running the ball against you well and, you know, running some clock, I think that was a bad decision by Brandon Staley and not him kind of sticking to what he said he was going to do. Well, it's just like, it's, it's like, are you only going to go for it on fourth down against teams where you feel like you need to do that to win? Or is that truly a integral part of your identity? I think that's the question that we're starting to ponder after a decision like that, because against the chiefs, it was fourth or five, fourth, fourth, fourth and six. They were going for it for sure. Like there's no question. It wasn't even a, a second thought that that was an automatic decision. So why against the Texans? I mean, obviously clearly a three and 11 team, right? Why aren't you going for it there when you have a perfect opportunity and the analytics are supporting that decision for you to go for it in that situation, keep your offense on the field, keep driving, keep them, their offense on off of the field, who has been driving on you successfully all, all day long. And your defense has not been able to stop anybody. So uh, your best option was to stay on the field. And it seemed pretty clear to me in that situation. So that one that one is definitely confounding to me. Yeah, and I mean, at that point, I guess you didn't know how good the Texans offense was going to be. I mean, you'd seen some drives from them by that point. But, I mean, still, you had way too much faith in your defense if you're feeling good about those three points as opposed to you know, going for it or, you know, not trusting your defense when you're going up against the Chiefs. I mean, I think that was smart. And the thing is, I see, I saw some people were kind of like, well, you can't, you know, be mad about the field goals this week if you were mad about them not going for it last week. But it's like, we were okay with those decisions yeah. last week, right? Yeah. And that's the thing is like, we're okay with him being aggressive. But if you're going to do it, be consistent, right? And, and do things that are going to help your team. I think that fourth and five was one they should have absolutely went for instead of, you know, trying to attempt a longest field goal, even though they made it. Still yeah. was a good chance to kind of change momentum in the game. But the thing about Kenneth Murray being on the edge is the Chargers didn't really have a lot of options there, right. which kind of forced their hand. But there was something they were already experimenting with. But to think he was ready for a full-time role was not the case in no this way. one. You had Uchenu and Wosu, who was really the only threat out there, and he didn't have any kind of notable game to write home about. And maybe it was just because of the extra attention. But I do think one thing that obviously 
jumped off the screen in this game specifically was the Chargers' lack of depth and how incomplete this roster was because, is you know, the Chargers had a ton of guys on the list, right? It's impossible to ignore that. You have Corey Lindsley, Mike Williams, Jalen Guyton, Joey Bosa, Michael Davis, Justin Jones, a ton of talented players. Austin Eckler, if I didn't say that, I mean, like, that's a huge, those are huge impact players for you as well yeah. as starters. No doubt. But there's a lot of guys after that where you need to be able to at least get average play, right? And I think that's what you saw in this game, how top-heavy the Chargers were. And I think that directly falls on Tom Telesco's lap because we knew about some of these deficiencies. We wondered about, you know, the depth, that edge rusher with Kyler Fackrell, and then relying a lot on a fourth-round pick from this year and Chris Rump. We knew the Chargers were, you know, asking a lot of their safeties when they didn't pick a safety until the seventh round, even though Derwin James and Nazir Adderley have extensive injury history, right? And they still went into it feeling good about a Lowy Gilman who didn't have a good day and Mark uh-huh. Webb Jr. who's on IR, right? So yep. that's a little different. But at the same time, like, this team is not a well-built team. It's a shallow team. It's a top-heavy team. And I do think Tom Telesco deserves a lot of blame for that. And I think that's consistent with kind of how we felt all year when this depth has gotten exposed the way it has. Yeah, I mean, we knew going into the season that they needed more pass rush. They they needed more on the interior of the defensive line. They needed another corner, like another one. Yeah, they drafted Asante, but they needed another one. And I think that's very clear. And obviously now safety is another one of those situations where you just don't feel great about it. And the, the other thing is, is the lack of depth has permeated throughout both sides. And not just both sides, all three sides. I mean, you look at every facet of this of this team on offense, there are, are things that would be, be would be great to, to upgrade for sure uh, on on defense everywhere you look. I mean, you want more on the defensive line. You want more pass rushers. You want more corners. You want more safeties. And then special teams. You have one of the worst special teams units in the league, and that's also another direct reflection of the lack of depth that falls squarely on the shoulders of the general manager Tom Telesco. He has not done a good enough job hitting on those late to mid round picks, and it has clearly shown itself this year. Yeah, and this game was an outlier. It's not always going to be like this. You're not going to have 14 dudes and a lot of impact players that aren't going to be able to play. But when it does happen, you better hope that, you know, some of those mid-round picks and guys like that that you have picked are ready to step up to the plate. And a lot of these guys were picked up off the streets, right? Devontae Harris picked up off the streets. Trey Marshall last week, a guy who got exposed, picked up off the streets in the middle, you know. He's saying Bassey, a guy you just signed, was playing in the game. Exactly. And I mean, I, I think there was just too much faith in, in some of Tom Tulesco's other draft picks, right? And I wonder, you know, if there is any like directive from the top, you know, to give Kenneth Murray a certain amount or Jerry Tillery a certain amount or anything. And that's total. I, I don't know anything, right? You would just wonder. And I mean, that's just maybe conjecture, were, right? Yeah. That's just thinking us thinking out loud. For sure. I mean, and I don't necessarily think that's the case. I mean, Brandon Staley might have thought that was his best option. And that, I mean, still is kind of or a reflection of, yeah, I mean, that's still a reflection of him not being comfortable with the other guys they have behind their top line starters, right? And I think that's yeah. just, Tom Tulesco's had a lot of time. The offensive line was a lot better to start the season, but you couldn't build it all in one off season, and you didn't have the depth to replace it. You're missing 60% of the original people you thought were going to go out there on Sunday. The yep. safeties, you had... You know, a guy you felt good about as a backup, a Louis Gilman playing extended snaps, and you saw what that looked like. And you know Derwin James has an injury history, right? You mm-hmm. knew Joey Bosa didn't have a true dominant player on the other side of him to help him out. You were good with Uchenna and Wozu. You were good with Kyler Fackrell. Even though Uchenna has flashed lately, it's not enough. You need more guys at that position. So the depth was, I thought, really the biggest part of this game where you saw how bad it really was. And how little difference there was from the Texans and the Chargers. We went into it knowing the Chargers were a much more talented team. When you take away those super talented players, they didn't look like the more talented team on Sunday against the Texans. So that is something that has to be addressed. I mean, and and continues, you know, to not be addressed to this point. This was, I think, one of the better off seasons for Tom Telesco, but they need a lot more and they need a lot more very quickly to kind of capitalize on the, you know, opportunity that they have right now. But, there were a specific sequence of events that I think kind of let this game get away. And I think there's ways to do better going forward. But I want to kind of pinpoint the things that went wrong for the Chargers in this game. Since we're not going to do a what went right, what went wrong tomorrow, we'll get into some of the things that where the Chargers had a chance to kind of get back in this game, take control of this game, and then just couldn't do it. 
coming up after this. But first thing you tell you guys that the one thing you can do, especially when the Chargers aren't a lot of fun to watch like they were on Sunday, is find some other games to watch. And even if they're not great games, the one thing that always makes any game great is having some action on the games. And when I do that, there's only one place I go to, and it's betonline.ag. BetOnline has you covered for the holiday season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march through college bowl season and the NFL playoffs. And right now, guys, they have so many great things that you can choose from to bet a little and win a lot. There's so many bowl games and great stuff going on right now. The NFL playoffs are coming up. That's going to be a lot of fun to bet on as well. And it's not just football either, right? You can go basketball, NHL, boxing, UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. And you can even play with some house money because if you guys go to the mobile website to sign up today, you can receive a 50% welcome bonus with the promo code locked on to get some free money to play with. That's promo code locked on, all caps, one word to get a 50% deposit bonus. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. So don't wait to take advantage of all the new offers that they have available. Bet online where the game starts. All right, David. Well, I didn't want to go through a full recap, and we're not going to on this show, and no, no one needs to hear. But no. it felt like there was a few times where the Chargers had a great opportunity to either take this game back, right? Yeah, or to you know actually stay in the game at certain points as well, and to go up. And I think it started for the Chargers at a very specific time, and I think it was Justin Herbert's first interception because the offense wasn't good before that. You had settled for two field goals. You had the fourth and five we talked about where you should have considered going for it. But the Chargers had a four-minute drill basically before half. They could go run the clock down, get a touchdown, go into the half with a good size lead, right? And then you do a full pendulum swing, and it totally flips around on you, right, with the Justin Herbert interception. And it was a bad interception. I know there's a lot of people saying, you know, Josh Palmer should have broken it up. Even if you go with that, still a bad decision. I mean, he threw the ball late. There was really no window there. You could see there was still a defender over the top coming in on it. It looked like, I mean, he had all the time in the world. He wanted to take the shot. He took the shot and it backfired. And I mean, worst case, you know, best case scenario, that's an incomplete pass. Maybe Josh Palmer totally mosses him, but it wasn't a good play. And what did it lead to was the Texans going on a 94-yard touchdown drive after that. So you have a great chance, right, to go up and you just totally blow it, give them points on the other side of it, would not even give yourself a chance to come back. With that drive that the Texans had, the 94-yard touchdown drive that they had, you have a 36-yard gain over Asante Samuel Jr. You have a 41-yard touchdown over Devontae Harris with, I mean, no time left in the first half, and you give that up. Give up that long touchdown at that point. I mean, Herbert forced the pass to Palmer on first and 10. Mills hits, you know, 36, 41-yard touchdown. But the biggest thing for that was the uh, holding call on Limbaugh Joseph. That was a really bad call. I mean, that one, as much as you don't like to, you know, just totally blame things on officiating, this game was not lost on this play. But to call a defensive holding there with Limbaugh Joseph engaging two offensive linemen and not holding them or stopping them to go anywhere on a play which it would have been a third and 12 from the Texans' four-yard line is what would have happened instead automatic first down two bombs and you give up a touchdown right before half and you you know are giving them the ball at halftime as well to kind of double down on it yeah it was just like the the type of complimentary football you don't want to see the the negative kind i mean you you have a bad a bad play on offense where you know justin herbert forces a throw into double coverage where he threw the ball late and, and made the decision late and that turned into an interception uh when you had a very good opportunity to go in and score points and then you give the ball back to the, the the Texans who start off the drive in the best kind of way for you. You know they they get two uh, you know procedural pen, penalties and back them up even further. They're basically you know in, in safety range. You know the Chargers defense could have forced a safety in that situation. And then that really bad penalty happened. And then after that, it was the floodgates. They just opened wide up for the Houston Texans. They took the deep shots. They converted them, and they marched all the way down the field and scored a touchdown. And that right there, the, that's that that momentum that really shows itself to be alive in a football game. It's tangible. You can feel it. You can see it. That's exactly that. That momentum, it just went in the opposite direction for the Chargers, and it really never came back. Well, the thing about it is it was first down too, right? To force that throw on, on first down is bad. I mean, it was a bad penalty on, on Limbaugh Joseph, that was called, but even having Devontae Harris and, you know, in a, a situation like that with that much time left in that, you know, the half to go one-on-one deep, 
like that to have that kind of one-on-one opportunity. It was a great throw by Davis Mills, but the Chargers absolutely blew it. And we've seen that in multiple halves this season, not ending the first half in a good way. But you were up, you know, at that point, 12 to 10. You have a chance to go make it potentially 20 to 10 and be doubling them going into halftime with them getting the ball and a chance to kind of change things in the second half. Instead, you go into halftime 17 to 12, which totally just killed anything that you had going. And the offense had a chance to really get back on track after a touchdown drive, after a couple of field goal drives. It seemed like they were starting to click. They lost it with that Justin Herbert interception and the defense obviously giving up those giant plays. Because, yeah, I mean, Justin Herbert, bad plays. It's also very bad to give up two 36-plus yard passes on a single drive right before halftime. But after the half, wasn't great either because the Chargers had a prime opportunity to get some points after a missed opportunity by the Texans. The Texans missed a field goal to open up the second half. They were still moving the ball well. The Chargers only forced one punt all day, and it was in the first half. So the Chargers weren't getting any stops. They get off the field with zero points allowed there. And then on the Chargers' next drive, you have Herbert get sacked. Brashawn Slater gets a false start, brings up a third and 21, really knocks you out of being able to have a meaningful fourth down attempt because I believe it was like fourth and 13 or something at that point. Probably too long to go for it. You cut it to 17-15. You should have been up 20-10 to 10 going into halftime, right? And now you're taking a field goal to make it 20-15. to 15. The Texans end up coming back, getting a field goal and a touchdown, surrounded by a Chargers fumble. And that's really what kind of put this, not put this game away, but it put the Chargers in big trouble in the second half. That fumble by Justin Jackson was really bad. They get a field goal off of that. They gave up a touchdown the drive before after you had to settle for a field goal. And it's points like that where you can point to a loss, okay, they didn't execute right there, and that's a huge swing that gave the Texans all the momentum that they needed to kind of go out and finish it. Well, I mean, I think if you look at the data, like any time you give up a, a, a turnover and give the ball away, it seems like overwhelmingly that team that gets that turnover, they turn that into points a lot, yeah. a lot of the time. And that was that 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 was very, very apparent in this game. <laughs> I mean, it, Herbert interception turns into a touchdown. Fumble turns into a touchdown. Another interception, that was a touchdown because it was a pick six. So it, it just, you, you can't have that against this team. That was one of the keys, right? That was one of the keys going into this game is that you cannot have those disaster plays. You cannot give them extra possessions. That's exactly what they did. And every single time they gave the ball away, it turned into points for the Texans. Yeah, and I mean, Herbert threw a pick six too, which is another, you know, seven points you give up off a turnover. The game was over. At that point, you know, less than two minutes left. You're down by two scores. But at the same time, I mean, yeah, that's what it was. I mean, you couldn't let them lean on you in the running game, right, and, and shorten your time of possession. and shorten They the did it. Of, which they did. You couldn't have the, you know, disaster plays, which they did. You couldn't lose the turnover battle, which they did. And that's how you lose to bad teams. But they still had a chance, right? They went back. They had a nice touchdown drive after the fumble, after the Texans tack on a field goal. You go down and you cut it to 27 23 get a two-point conversion and now all you have to do is hold them to a field goal and you at least have a chance to go down and tie it right and you also have a chance to get a stop and be down by four points with the ball late in the fourth quarter which is at that point after how bad the game was that's the best situation you can ask for and it was just a disaster for the Chargers defense I mean there was no reason to think they were going to get a stop but they had a great opportunity to kind of save the game at that point and give the Chargers a real chance but they couldn't. I mean, Justin Jackson scores a touchdown to make it 27-23. On third and three, Brandon Staley with a very questionable clock management situation. The cl- play clock is about to expire. The Texans are about to run a play on third and three. Staley calls a timeout because he doesn't like something that he sees. It saves no time because the time was running before that, right? And then you go up and just give up a four-yard gain on the ground and a first down anyways. like That's a bad look for you because that just didn't go well at all. Right after that, you go up a 36-yard gain to Rex Burkhead, which made me want to throw up because yeah, not the dude that gets explosive runs. And Amen Ogbongbamiga had a chance for a three-yard tackle for loss. They had the guy in the right spot to make a great play. He can't make the tackle, and it turns into a giant gain. And you still had a chance. <laughs> but on second and 12, you give a 14-yard run to Rex Burkhead. The bad run defense was apparent all day. And then all you had to do is hold him to a field goal to at least keep yourself within a touchdown. You give up an easy 13-yard touchdown to Nico Collins that really ended things right there. Then Herbert throws the pick six and the garbage time situation happens. But that was another point in this game, David, where the Chargers still had a chance late in the fourth quarter 
to make a play, you know, one defensive play was really all you needed there to at least give your offense a chance. And, you know, never know what would have happened. But either way, what a disappointing game for the Chargers. And and I think fans have every right to be upset about it. And I think this is something that is going to be hard to bounce back from because now their playoff chances just got a lot harder. Yeah, because they no longer control their own destiny, Daniel. They they need help. You know, they can't just win out and get to the playoffs. They need people to lose and they need to win out. And, you know, you're going up against two division opponents that, you know, one's already beaten you and one looks like they're, you know, playing a little bit better football right now. So it's it's not a guarantee. It's just an, another another situation where the, where the Chargers just fail i mean they they had one chance they had one real chance to get back in the game and all they had to do was just not give up a touchdown they just had to to, they had to hold it to three points and they couldn't do it and they and that was it and i mean you, you felt it i mean you felt it at that point because nothing that happened during the course of that game gave you any type of confidence that they were going to be able to execute in that situation especially on defense because they didn't get really any stops at any point during that game. So, of course, they didn't get to stop. They give up the touchdown, and at that point, it's pretty much over. It was. And, I mean, the Chargers, I think the thing is it's hard for the rest of the season. It's just hard to have confidence of knowing, you know, which team is going to show up, which players are going to be able for these You're final not see Homer, games. Homer David for the last two games. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pick them to win these final games. They proved to me otherwise. This team should be pissed off. Like, they should be embarrassed they they should they should need to take a good long hard look and let this one be painful because it they need that to turn that motivation to go out there and play better because this was a horrible performance. Yeah, and I think there's you know some poor effort as well when you look at the tackling and things like that. It wasn't great in this game, but the Chargers still have a chance to make the playoffs. So as much as this game sucks, the season is not over, even though it feels like no. that. Right now, I mean, they still have a path to the playoffs, but they have to have some other teams to lose. The good news is those teams they need to lose have some losable games on their schedule. So on tomorrow's show, we'll get into what the Chargers have to do now to make the playoffs and kind of roll through some of those situations, which some are likely. I mean, if the Chargers take care of business, there's still a good chance they can make the playoffs. There's a good chance the other two teams will lose that they need to. But we're going to get more into that on tomorrow's show and what the Chargers have to do to make sure they give themselves a chance at the playoffs tomorrow. But until then, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already to the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel. If you're watching now, make sure to go hit the subscribe button. And also, you can follow the show, rate and review wherever you get your podcast from. You can find the Locked On Chargers podcast there. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at Dan Talk Sports and David on Twitter at Drew Talk SD and the show's Twitter at Locked On LAC. We post every show to all of those places every day. And if you guys want to vent about this game, We'll probably definitely have some voicemails this week with how bad this was. I think the people need to vent. If you want to get in on that, the number is 323-524-7924. And we try to get every Chargers voicemail played on the show. But be upset about it now. Still a lot to play for this season and a lot of reason to, you know, at least keep paying attention, at least a reason to keep on watching these games, even though it doesn't feel like it after this one. But we'll talk about how the Chargers can still make the playoffs tomorrow. Until then, take it easy and go Bolts.